how do we overcome? When we face fear, doubt, depression, and rejection, what assurance do we have that we can fight this fight and win? Jesus, the Son of God, became man and faced the things we face, put himself in our place to stare down death and put death in the grave. That same power that raised him up from the dead is still alive and is living in us. Now we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and by his power we will overcome. Amen. Hey, you don't have to hold back that clap. We can give God praise in Jesus' name. Well, I just wanna take a moment just to welcome everyone who's watching online, and of course, everyone who is in South Tampa listening to this message, we love you. You are a part of our family. Let's welcome South Tampa and all those that are watching online. We love y'all. So the last time I spoke, I preached a message on asking the question, God, God why are you so slow? God, why don't I feel you? Why aren't you moving in the way that I thought you would? And in that message, I talked about my health and some of the things that I've been going through. And, you know, I've been waiting back from a bone marrow test. I've been waiting back from a PET scan and all these different things. And over the last three weeks, God has still been making me say, God, what is going on? Okay, <laughs> where are you? I've got two doctors saying two completely different things. And finally, we have a consensus uh, we've been able to find a test, and I have Lyme, Lyme disease. So we're, well, now, if you heard some of the stuff they were saying before, you'd be like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. So, you know, I'm taking, I'm taking medication. I'm doing the things that I need to do, uh, but it's going to be a little bit of a process. But really, from the bottom of my heart, I, I just want to thank everybody. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for standing with us. You know, in this church, we say all the time, like, you are a part of our family, and, and we mean that. You're a part of our family. I could feel your prayers. I could, I could feel just the love from you guys reaching out, so thank you. I love y'all. You really are a part of our family, and we're going to get through this in the name of Jesus. So in this message series right now, we're in a message series that is called Overcomer, and I want you to know this, that whatever you are facing in your life, temptation pain, a tribulation, what we can see in scripture and what God's word says is Jesus has been there. He's endured it. He has gone through it. He understands and he has overcome. Now, a few weeks ago when I started preparing for this message, I go to Pastor Glenn. I'm like, hey, Pastor Glenn, what do you want me to talk about? I can talk about this. And I gave him three really good options. And he said, you know what? Those are good, but I want you to talk about anger. And that made me mad. Because that, because that, that's a tough thing to talk about. Because, but here's the truth, though. This is something we all deal with to some degree. Can I get an amen? amen. So I want to take a poll, okay? I'm going to say a few different things. If this makes you mad, just raise your hand. You're in church. South Tampa, I need you to be a part of this. Raise your hand. Be honest. Bad drivers. Someone just got slain in the spirit over here. They, oh, Jesus. People who chew loudly. The other day I'm chewing, I'm eating dinner. My, my three-year-old, she covers my mouth and goes, no. No, dad. My like, girl, you get your hand off me, girl. <laughs> People who one up you. Oh, you come back, you're like, oh, my vacation was great. And someone said, oh, I've been there before, but my vacation was way better than you. So people who one up you. When someone text, when you text somebody and they leave you on red, they don't text you back. Just turn, there's a setting. Just, just, just turn it off. When you stub your toe, yep, that'll that will get you. Husbands, this is just for the husbands. When you ask your wife, "Are you hungry? Do you want something to eat? Would you like anything from takeout?" and they say no, and then they get home and they eat half your food. They, <laughs> Maybe that, that's, just, that's just my wife. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, but here's the truth. We have an anger issue. Now, you may feel like, hey, that's not me. I, that, this is something we all deal with to some degree. Now, maybe you don't believe me. Let's look at the numbers of the global rise of unhappiness. According to the 2022 Global Emotions Report, yes, there's a report for your emotions, okay? And what this report shows is 
We need Jesus, okay? Because in 2021, negative emotions, the, the aggregate of stress, sadness, anger, worry, and physical, physical pain that people feel every day reached a new record in the history of Gallup's tracking. As negative emotions have, increasingly, have increased globally, so has civil unrest. According to the Global Peace Index, riots, strikes, and anti-government demonstrations increased 244% from 2011 to 2019. And in 2020, we want to forget that year so badly. But here's the thing. In 2020, unrest increased exponentially with over 15,000 protests globally. Now, you may hear these numbers and say, oh, that's just in retaliation to the government. That makes me want to retaliate too. No, anger is on the rise. This was another, another study done by the American Psychological Association. It says that 84% of Americans are angrier today than they were a year ago. 56% of Americans are upset by the future election. It's not even here yet. And we're already angry. That number is going to go up even more here pretty soon. 25% of Americans are frequently angry in their home, in the place where they should feel peace, the place where their family is, 25%. 60% of Americans report feeling angry or irritable often every single week, and 85% of Americans are upset on how this culture and how this country is evolving, having anger, levels of anger rising. But can we be honest? We feel it. We feel it in our holidays, right? When your in-laws are in town and they start to talk about something, then you're like, why are we talking about that right now at the dinner table? But we feel it in our workplaces. We feel it in our marriages, a place where we should be so tight together. We feel it. We feel it with our kids and we see it on social media. I just want to tell you something. You may not know this, but anything that you like or comment on on Facebook, your friends see it. So just think about that before you try to start World War III on Facebook because all your friends are seeing it and we're all secretly judging you, okay? <laughs> Here's what I want us to know today in this church. We as followers of Jesus, we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. What does this mean? As an ambassador, you are a representative so when people see us, when people see me, when people see you, what should they see? They should see Jesus. But if we're honest, a lot of time what they see is an angry person getting in a fight on Facebook. We are representing Jesus. I want you to know this. We are not called to look like the world we're not called to act like the world. We don't have to react like the world does. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are called to operate in the fruit of the Spirit. What is that? Let's go through it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. That's number seven. It ranks kind of low. Faithfulness, self-control, self-control. That's the last one. I mean, that's but it's so important. How is there evidence that the Holy Spirit is living inside of you? The fruit of your life. How do I know if God is living in me? There has been life change that has taken place. I'm not the person I used to be. Now, you may, you may hear this message and be like, hey, this is something that God's purifying on me right now. Well, let today be a purification process because I believe that it's time for us not to operate like the world in this way, but to operate in love, in joy, in self-control, not in anger, not to be reactive, but to operate in peace. Ephesians 4.26 says this, in your anger, do not sin. In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. But hey, if you're anything like me, if, you're, if, if you are human, you have likely failed at this. So, so what do we do with our anger? I've got good news. We can look to Jesus. Because like we're talking about in this message series, Jesus has overcome. If you've ever been angry, if you've ever lost your temper, 
If you rode with your spouse on the way to church today and you got into a fight, don't worry. He has been there. Jesus understands. Now, when Christians think about Jesus and being angry, what's the first thing in the Bible we think about? What story? When Jesus overturns the the tables in the temple. So I'm not preaching on that today because you're expecting it. But here's what I want you to know. (laughs) Jesus saw his father's house being t- turning into a marketplace. It was a place where they were selling sacrifices. They were robbing from the poor from an unjust exchange rate. He saw people being excluded from being able to partake and worship God. I want you to know this. When Jesus got upset every single time in scripture, it wasn't because someone wronged him. When Jesus got upset, it was because someone was wronged by him. He saw something taking place. I want you to know this, that when our anger leads us to hurt or destruction, it's probably not from God. But when our anger leads us to action, it brings healing and restoration. I want you to know that God is definitely in it. So let's take a look at another example. This is going to be in Mark chapter three. And this right here, this is a text that so many people overlook. It says this, Jesus, he went into the synagogue again. And noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies were watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Now in this time, and obviously now still, Sabbath is such an important thing. But in this time, people did absolutely nothing. They didn't work. They didn't do a thing. They didn't cook. They cooked before. So Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. Let's go stand in front of the Pharisees. Let's stand in front of everyone. And he turned to his critics and said, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is, or is it a day for doing evil? Is the Sabbath a day to do good? Is it a, is it a day just to ignore things and ignore the needs of people? Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save a life or to destroy it? But they wouldn't answer him. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. So in this moment, Jesus knew that the Pharisees there were trying to get him. And he had an option, right? Am I going to do something that's good, even though it goes against the culture? Or am I going to ignore this man because that's exactly what everybody else wants me to do? He knew that if he healed this man, that they would go and try to plot how to kill him. But what does Jesus do? He says, I don't care about the culture. I don't care what the religious people say. I care what is important. I'm going to heal this man. Imagine how angry he was. This is all something we deal with. So so what is anger? The American Psychological Association defines anger as this. An emotion characterized by tension and hostility arising from frustration, real or imagined injury by another, or perceived injustice. Study shows that anger, it's not a primary emotion. It's a secondary emotion. Anger is an outward expression of an internal wound or offense. So so what can be the primary source of anger? Grief in your life. Losing a loved one. Sadness. Embarrassment uncertainty, disrespect, insecurity, pride, and and the list goes on and on and on. I want you to know all these emotions can be the root of anger. I want you to know this. It's not a sin to be angry. Jesus was angry, but it is wrong when we sin in our anger. So what is the cycle of anger? It starts with offense. There's something that took place. I was disrespected. I was demeaned. Someone took advantage of me. I was hurt, hurt by a loved one, whatever it is. There's an offense that takes place. And this is the next thing that takes place from that offense, from that hurt. There's a seed. There's a seed. And in that moment, this is something that's so important for us as Christians. 
What are we going to do with that seed? Are we going to let it grow deep into us? Or are we going to say, you know what? I'm moving on. I'm giving this to God, whatever it is. I, it doesn't matter if it's addressed or unaddressed. What am I going to do with the seed? The next thing that takes place is it takes root. Bitterness begins to grow. And there's small signs, maybe an eye roll or, or sighing or microaggressions, whatever it is. It begins to take root and it begins to weigh on your life. It begins to weigh on your emotions. And eventually there's an outburst. Sometimes people have a lot of outbursts in a day. But these outbursts, they make us feel good for a moment, but it leaves destruction along the way. So in our life, how do we overcome the cycle of anger? In today's message, I wanna give you three and a half points. So the half, it's something for you at the end. So hang with me. How do we overcome the cycle of anger? The first thing is this. We must discover why am I mad? Why are you upset? What took place? James 4, 1 through 2, it says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? What causes this? The fights, the disagreements, the anger. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but, you, but do not have. So you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. We're, we're against each other. We're fighting. We're arguing. Why are we upset? As a kid, anger was something that I dealt with a lot. My mom, she told me one time, she's like, I thought you were gonna get arrested and go to prison because of your anger. You were just gonna do something really stupid one day. Whenever I was in timeout, she would make me write a hundred times on a piece of paper, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. A hundred times or more if she was really angry at me. Now, as a child, one of the biggest things of, of my anger, it would take place on a baseball field or a football field. I would yell at kids I'm playing against. I would yell at referees. I'm, I'm being honest, okay? And, and one time in particular, my dad literally ripped me off the field because I was yelling at a referee. And he took me to a barber shop and he cut all my hair off. And he's like, you are filled with pride. You think you look good. You love your Justin Bieber hair. And he's like, not anymore. We're going to make you look like a nice boy. Guys, that's abusive. No, I'm just kidding. Now, now, now here's the thing. Now, the greater thing from that whole situation was the conversation that took place after the worst haircut of my life. The conversation that took place is him asking me, where is this coming from? And what we, def what we found out and what through our conversation was is my entire worth as a human being, as a 10, 11, and 12-year-old came from winning. Now, don't get me wrong. If I'm playing a sport, we're going to try to win, right? We ain't trying to lose. But in my mind and in my emotions, in those feelings, if we didn't win, I was worth nothing. That was what my identity was in. But now, transform coming towards our marriage, now me and Anna, my wife, were married. And something when we first got married was I was dealing with anger. And what I realized is we all have our preferences, right? And I was treating these preferences in my life and in my household like a morality issue. And I would get upset. And really what the root for me was and what I've come through and what I still have to remind myself every single day is it's not all about you. Selfishness. That's been the root of my pride since the beginning. It's all about me. Even as a father, something I have to watch myself. I'm, I ask my kids to do something. We preach obedience right away. Sometimes they don't, right? But we expect our kids to exercise self-control, but I wasn't exercising self-control myself. It's something we have to watch, but that is my root. It's selfishness. I want it my way. It's about me. So I want to ask you, what is your root? Were you hurt? Were you offended? Were you disrespected? Why are you getting mad? There's a root. Hebrews 12, 15, it says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. I want you to know that your bitter root isn't just affecting yourself. Your bitter root is affecting your family. Your bitter root is affecting your marriage. 
Your bitter root is affecting your kids and it's affecting people around you. It doesn't just defile yourself. It defiles many. So we've got to find this root. Where is my anger coming from? Maybe you ask yourself, how can I find this root? Step number one is calling on the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to give you a prayer for that. The prayer is this, is Holy Spirit, help me. Help me find this root. Help me find where my anger is coming from. And I will promise you this, he will reveal it to you. So you discover the root, right? Then what do you do? You disclose it. You talk about it. You bring it to life. I want you to know that sin grows best in the dark. So turn the light on it. Here's the thing. If you're an angry person, and this is something that you really, really struggle with, everybody knows you're mad. Okay? There's a, there's a look on your face. There's a, <laughs> you just walk around, and, you, and, you, and you're angry. It's clear. But here's the thing. Jesus had a look too. He looked around at them angrily. Listen, my mom has a look. <laughs> it, 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 growing up, if she gave me a look... You, you, you know, you better, get, you better stop doing what you're doing. You better, you better do what she's asking you to do or that pink spoon is coming out. So you, they give you the look. But here's the thing. We need to talk about it. I'm angry. I'm hurt because of this. I'm angry. I'm offended because of this. Or maybe you have no idea why you need to figure it out. Colossians 3.8 says this. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Who can you talk about it with? Maybe you need a counselor. Talk about it with a counselor. Maybe you can share it in your small group. If you don't have a small group, these are the people we do our life with. We don't do our life in rows. We do our life in circles. This is how we do our life. Bring it up in your small group a person that you trust, a family member that you really, really trust, your best friend who's your accountability partner. Bring it to light and let God heal it. We can confess to God. We can confess to people. People bring healing, but the ultimate healing is going to come from God. So bring it to him. Pray to him. This is the next prayer you can pray. Holy Spirit, heal me. Heal me. I don't know how I'm going to overcome this offense in my life. There's going to be work. There might need to be counseling. There might need to be therapy, whatever it may be. But I can promise you this. He is the one who is going to bring the healing. So pray for it. The next thing we have to do, and now it's our turn, right? We deny our flesh. Deny our flesh. What does the Bible say about our flesh, my heart? It's inherently evil. It's angry. It's filled with temptations. It's filled with lust and all these different things. I have to deny myself because when we're angry, what happens is we do something and we regret it or we embarrass ourselves. There's this comedian from the 1900s. His name's Groucho Marx. He said this. He says, speaking when you're angry and you... Speak when you're angry and you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. <laughs> it's true. That's my, my, my mom made me write that. I probably wrote that 10,000 times as a child. I'm going to be slow to speak. I'm going to be quick to listen. I'm going to be slow to become angry because in our anger, we can lash out and we hurt people because no one hurts people like hurt people, Right? That's why we need to have healing. Proverbs 29, 11, it says, fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. It's foolish to lash out. It's sinful to lash out. But the wise, we're going to bring calm, calmness. We're going to bring peace. You may have a reason to be angry, but I want you to know you don't have a right to sin. A lot of people... I feel like, oh, well, I need to rage out at them. They need to know how they made me feel. No, no, you don't. Oh, they need to deserve, they deserve my wrath. They need to, no. Well, this is just the way I grew up. We just talk like this and we can't. No, you don't. You don't have to respond. And I want you to know, not all anger is explosive. 
Sometimes it's a silent treatment. It's a cold shoulder. It's moving your feet away. It's withholding intimacy or affection. It's not making your spouse coffee in the morning when you always do. It doesn't have to be lashing out and it, no. But can we be honest? Sometimes the angriest people I know are Christians. Not everybody. I wouldn't even say a majority, but a lot of Christians can be extremely angry. They can look at this world and be like, oh man, this is terrible. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. This world just makes me so upset. This is why we are here. I don't like the culture. I don't like the lies that the enemy's spewing out. This is why I'm here. Anything in culture that is taking place, God's response is coming through you. So if the world sees anger and people just sitting on a couch shaking their head at Fox News and CNN and all this other stuff, nothing is going to change. We are co-laborers with Christ. The change comes from you. The change comes from me. That's why we're here. We have a purpose. We have a calling. It's not just to be angry. It's to make the change, to be the change. Galatians 2.20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live with faith in the Son of God who who loved me and gave himself for me. My flesh is angry. It's been crucified with him. I don't have to respond. I don't have to lash out. Yes, you can be angry, but don't sin. My prayer is that your anger would move you to a place to bring healing to somebody else. There's a feeling inside of you. Why do you, why do you feel, why does your heart break for the unborn? Maybe God wants you to do something. Maybe God wants you to give something. Maybe you have a, a heart for, for, for the troubled youth. Instead of just saying, man, this, this next generation is just terrible. Maybe God is moving you to do something. Like come and help me on Wednesday night. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying <laughs> What did Jesus not do? He did not lash out at them. He could have. It'd make me upset if I did something and then people were going to go and plot my, my death, but he didn't. Jesus was angry at the religious leaders. He gave them a look, but he did not sin. What does he do though? He heals a man's hand knowing that doing so would lead the Pharisees to go off to kill him. Instead, he did his father's will. Was it easy? Absolutely not. But is that what we're called to do? Absolutely. So if you're struggling with your anger, or maybe you're, you're feeling this message today, and you're like, man, where do I start? What do I do? You start with these three prayers. If you need to discover, Holy Spirit, help me. Where's this coming from? Why am I feeling this emotion? What is the root of my anger? If you need a disclosure, you need to talk about it. Holy Spirit, help me. Help me. Or heal me, I'm sorry. And the next thing, to deny your flesh. Holy Spirit, have your way. Holy Spirit, have your way. Because it's not my way. It's your way. My way is anger. My way is wrong. But God, I want to act in your way. Now, if something about me that you probably don't know is I'm like the side job king, okay? I do tons of side jobs all the time. If someone's like, hey, I need, I need you to do my lawn. I'll do you, I'll do your yard. You need something pressure washed? I'll, I'll do it. Uh, your toilet's not flush and I'll figure it out. If I don't know what to do, I'll just find it on YouTube and, and I'll watch the YouTube video while I do it and I'll charge the person. Now, <laughs> it's just how it goes. Now, there's this lady I used to take care of for a yard. And it was a beautiful yard, big, and she had these these beautiful flowers, this beautiful garden bed. And in this garden bed were amazing flowers. But the problem was, is it was covered in weeds. So every time I'd go to her yard, I I would, I would just, I'm like, what do you want me to do with this flower bed? And she's like, just weed whack it. So I'm like, okay, easy. Well, here's the problem is those weeds would come back every single time. 
Two weeks later, I'd come back. They're, they're taller than ever. And eventually she's like, I'm done with these weeds. I want them to be gone. I don't know. And I was like, well, here's what we need to do. We have to get the root. It's gonna take some work and I'm, it's gonna cost you something, okay? <laughs> but, but here's the thing. In our anger, I want you to know this. It is going to cost us something if we want healing because we have to get the root, we might need to go see somebody to talk to and get therapy and talk through different things and talk to a Christian counselor. There will be work. When you pull up those roots, it's painful. It costs us something. But I can promise you this, when the work is done, it's beautiful. Just like that lady's flower bed. She was so happy. She gave me a tip. I was like, praise God. Absolutely. Thank you so much. But it took work. It's going to cost us something. We have to do the work. We have to discover, disclose, and deny. What is that root? Is it something from your childhood? Is it something that took place in your marriage in the very beginning and we've been holding it the whole time? Is it something that your mother or father said to you? Where did it come from? Is it because of a loss, uncertainty, abuse you were taken advantage of? What is the root? We talk about it. We find healing. And I promise you this, as you put in the work, God will bring the healing. I've seen this in my own life. When I operate in the flesh, it hurts people. It hurts people's hearts. It hurts the people that I love the most heart. It hurts my kids. It hurts my wife. But here's the thing. I'm not going to operate in my flesh. I'm going to deny my flesh. I can operate in the fruit of the spirit because that's the evidence that Christ lives in me. I can operate in joy, in gentleness, in peace, in patience. That's what we can do. And the half point today is this. When we put in the work, when there's healing that takes place. We plant something new. Plant something new. We pull up the root. We pull out all the pain, the hurt. We don't just leave it alone. No, no, no. We plant something new, something that is life-giving. We can plant generosity. We can plant joy. We can plant encouragement. We can plant kindness. I can promise you this. If God asks you to put something down, it's because he wants you to pick something up that is so much greater. Put it down. And every time God asks us to put something down, a sin, a temptation, whatever it is, he's going to put something new in our hands, a calling, a purpose. So the question today, and this is where it comes to you, is what are you going to plant? What are you going to plant in your life? What are you going to be known by, by your children? What will you be known by, by your spouse and the people around you? The work you put in today is going to create the legacy for future, future generations tomorrow. Because our, our offense, our bitterness can continue to grow and grow with our children and grow into our families. Or we can say, no, 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 it stops with me. It stops with me. So Jesus got angry. Why? He looked around at them angrily and he was deeply saddened by their hearts. And then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. How did Jesus re respond or deal with his anger? He healed someone. It's the character of God to bring restoration to the, from the, to the brokenness. At some point, every single person in this room, everyone who's in South Tampa, we will struggle with anger. We all need healing from our past hurts, our offenses, our bitterness, whatever it may be. The good news is this. Jesus stands ready to heal us. Just like in the story, the only thing he says is reach out your hand. Reach out your hand. There's people in the room today. There's people online and in South Tampa who need to reach out their hand to God. So I want to say a prayer over you today. If you want to bow your heads. Lord Jesus, I, th I thank you for what you're doing in this place today. We're talking about something that everybody deals with, God, but I pray right now in this room, Lord Jesus, you just begin to mend hearts, Lord Jesus. 
whatever the pain is that took place, whatever, whatever the hurt is, whatever the, wherever the bitterness came from, God, we pray that you will bring restoration in Jesus' name. We pray, God, that people won't just stay angry, God, but they will be moved into action, God. You've given us emotions, Lord, but we are not our emotions, God. You have given us the fruit of the Spirit. I pray, God, that we will exercise love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control wherever we go as we are your ambassadors. Bring healing in Jesus' name. Healing from our childhood, healing from our present, healing from a, from a trauma or, or a difficult situation. God, bring healing to our hearts today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you're in here today and you've never made that choice to say, God, I want to surrender everything to you. I don't want to just surrender my anger. I want to surrender my past, my past hurts, my, my past sins. I want you to know that something is available for you today. It's called salvation. It's a fresh start. Wherever you've been, whatever you've done, Jesus has paid the price. We celebrated it last week. He died for our sins. He died for your sins. Everything you've ever done, he's given you a new chance, a new heart, and that's available for you today. So if you're in here today and you say, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand on the count of three and I wanna pray for you. One, two, three. Just raise your hand. I wanna say a prayer for you, amen. You can put your hands down. If you raise your hand, this is the start of your relationship with God. I promise you this, God always wants to hear from you. He's a relational God. So just begin to talk to him. Say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins, where I've been, the things that I've done. Today, I'm, I'm changing the goal of my life. I'm repenting. I'm, I'm turning away from who I used to be and I'm, I'm running towards you. Declare his lordship over you as I pray for you now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the people that are receiving you as their Lord and Savior right now. Today, Lord Jesus, we repent. We turn away from the person we used to be. We're changing the goal. It's not about us anymore. It's about you. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, creating us a new heart, a heart that's ready to follow you, that's ready to submit to you. Change the lens of how we view our life, the people around us, God. Today, we declare our, your lordship over us, God. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. In this life, it's not just for us anymore. We're living for you. In your name I pray, amen.